you know, we've seen Russia invade Ukraine and, and what's happening there is the Christians are on the rise and they're praying and they're, they're worshiping, Tony, they're worshiping in the midst of the threat of their lives and their, their freedom. They are worshiping God. Worship is the first touch point when someone walks into a church and mm-hmm. worship it has to be clear. It has to be authentic. It has to be, yeah. we need to be able to let people experience the Father. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, friends. It was a season of absolute heartache for me when I walked through the doors of a new church in North Dallas area 15 years ago. I wanted to hide in the crowd that day and not be seen at all, but I was so hungry to feel the Spirit of the Lord. And that was the day that I encountered the presence of worship from my dear and gifted friend. Tony Ellenberg is a 40-year music industry veteran who left Nashville to help build one of the fastest growing churches in North Dallas, where he served as the executive worship pastor. As a songwriter and recording artist, Tony and his songs have been heard on national Christian radio with 10 top 20 hits. Thanks to his and Stephen Curtis Chapman's hit song, Waiting for Lightning, the album reached gold status. Tony is an author of a brand new book, which we're going to talk about today, A Worship Shepherd. And Tony, I want to welcome you, my dear, dear friend. I sure appreciate you being on the show with me today. Oh, thank you, Brenda. That's so encouraging. And that introduction, I do remember when you came to be a part of our worship ministry. It wasn't, we don't minister from a play, from a pedestal mm-hmm. of perfection. And it was your authenticity and mm-hmm. your and your brokenness that you ministered out of, mm. which we found very refreshing. It made mm. it, it made for a wonderful a wonderful vessel. Wow. Well, thank you. And you know, I I have to say that that was a time of healing for me. That was in the midst of really my cocoon season, and how you ministered such sensitivity and grace and love. Uh, in in such an encouraging way to me was so refreshing. And, uh, you know, I was able to heal and that place was really a safe harbor for me. And, and that's the reason I wanted to have this conversation with you today, because I respect so much your level of giftedness and your talent. I mean, let's talk a little bit first about even some of the, for our audience today, some of the um, uh, the projects that you even have worked on in Nashville, I mean, to understand the level of quality of work that's come from you over the years, both in the secular industry, as well as with uh, Christian music. Um, tell us a little bit of some of the artists you've worked with and and uh, then how God has moved you uh, in, into this season. You know, uh, I'm a graduate of Belmont University, and uh, you can't help but be connected to very good quality people when you're that well networked. Uh, but you know, I, Dan Huff, who is a producer for Keith Urban and tons of other artists, um, restless heart was a lot of guys that, uh, that I went to school with. Uh, these are names from the eighties and nineties. Probably people might not recognize. Uh, I worked, uh, I wrote a little bit for Dolly Parton's publishing company, uh, during uh, her nine to five years, uh, not much, but they were encouraging to me. And, um, and then I, I was a Christian and I was a songwriter, but I wasn't writing Christian music. I met, uh, Greg Nelson, who was a wonderful mentor for me and many others who was producing anyone who was, who was doing well back in those days, but he began to take me under his wing and, and help me. And, uh, that's where Stephen wow. Curtis Chapman and I began to have a relationship and, and many other artists there that, uh, but that gives you an idea of the taste of what I was involved with. Oh, it's wonderful. And so God transitioned, uh, uh, really kind of put on your heart the desire to want to be involved in shepherding um, in, in the area of worship. And tell me what that looked like. What, what, what did that transition look like for you? Well, you know, um, it's curious when God really 
comes to decides to move you and knows that there's a new gear that I have for you, a new plan, a new, a new place. It gets a little uncomfortable sometimes at point a to get to that point B. And, uh, I, I did, I got, I, the Lord began to stir in me some things that were unfulfilled. And mm -hmm. I began to, I began to, uh, recognize that there was something God that he wanted to, to invest in me to other people. And I said, okay, Lord, if, if you want me to begin to, uh, deposit some, some of these things and younger worship uh, leaders mm -hmm. and or other young musicians, then show me where. And within six to eight months, I had, uh, you know, up to 13 young uh, writers and, and musicians in my studio, and we were just sharing life together. And wow. uh, so it became, it became, it came very natural. Uh, yeah. David, David Vestal, who was the pastor at Lighthouse in Dallas, um, was pastoring a church that, um, and he, you know, I felt like it was a great place for me to go and till that garden for a while. So, it yeah. Was oh, it's wonderful. There's a quote in your book that says, Pastoring and shepherding a worship team is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So, uh, tell us what you mean by that. Well, you know, so much of shepherding, it, it's not about um, it's not about what you. Uh, it, it's not about your big ideas. It's more about life, and doing mm -hmm. life with people. You know, sometimes, sometimes the investment you make in someone is music, and learning mm -hmm. to uh, learning to have a good posture in front of a congregation. What what should the posture of our heart be? But sometimes it's coming alongside. Uh, someone totally unmusic related. Uh, mm -hmm. They're going through a very difficult struggle in their life, uh, going through one of life's chaotic moments, uh, uh, a death, a marriage. You celebrate when they celebrate and you mourn with them when they mourn. Yeah. Those kinds of investments give, uh, especially creatives, it gives them mm -hmm. a safe place where they mm -hmm. can learn to have a context for the gift mm -hmm. that God has given them. And it's about making better husbands, better wives, better fathers, brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and so on. So good. Uh, so, you know, bringing a gospel, a, a gospel influence into worship ministry is it it's, you have to be more patient because yeah. it's about life. It's not just about music. Mm -hmm. so, so you're walking people through their valleys and their their triumphs and the, just the life experiences. I think, you know, in our culture, uh, sadly, a large portion of the church has been affected by the narcissism that, that we've just grown so familiar with in our culture, you know, with a very celebrity mentality. And so we've really kind of moved away from and, and perhaps even lost our way a little bit from the early model or the model of the early church where community was really such a um an important emphasis and part of our growth and i mean i i think perhaps that might be um ha has caused a little bit of trouble within the church culture and we're really i don't know about you but i feel like we're in a, a season right now where um we could almost say that during this time of great shaking and and these painful things that are happening in a chaos around the world it's putting us in a place where we can really um, be more open and vulnerable and listen, perhaps to let God recalibrate us and bring us back to a place of, of purity with him. There's another quote in your book that says, effective and dynamic worship is not simply in the ability to reproduce, that's a good word, or look uh, a look or sound. It's the result of a disciplined pursuit of an authentic expression of worship. So help us understand, Tony, because I think some of our viewers today might not even understand what that means or the difference because they've been so used to being fed the product of worship music. Um, and so their experience with worship 
has more to do with the smoke and the lights and the experience and the feelings and all that. But take us to a deeper place right now and talk about what worship really is and how we really could use a refreshing in in the sense of what we're doing in our local churches and the expression, what that should look like for each and every church. Brenda, I, I love your wording. And first of all, that is very perceptive. That's a good picture of where we are right now. And your word that you used, how do we recalibrate? Mm -hmm. uh, and in, one, in one word, it is the gospel. You know, when we think about the gospel, we usually don't consider that it does speak to, uh, it, it provides a template for not just our worship songs, but also the way we do worship ministry. And, yeah. uh, you know, when we put those glasses on, we put the glasses of the gospel, that's a filter. And as a, you know, we love worship leaders. We love town. You know, they're such, they're such gifted people. They they're are. They are such a crossroads of giftings that are taking place sim simultaneously. And sometimes it's hard to recognize just exactly how many things that that worship leader has to be attuned to, not the least of yeah. which is just the spirit of God. How is God speaking in the moment? What's the rhema mm -hmm. word? What's the word for the hour and how to be sensitive in our worship to move our congregation in that direction? Yeah. But to, to answer your question specifically, um, you know, when you stand before a congregation, uh, I, I, I really, my heart is for, for us to become shepherds um, mm -hmm. because you can plan, you can do all the things, you can rehearse, you can do all the things that we need to do. We, we really do need to do those things. But when you turn around and face that congregation and you realize there's hurting people out yeah. here today, yeah. the, these, there are, there's someone here today, if they don't have an encounter with an almighty God, a God that is greater than any circumstance they may have walked in with, if they don't encounter the reality of who he is, they're at a desperate time. And when we realize that, that, that what we have to offer is an opportunity to set up a meeting place between God and that person, mm. And we need to be we need to be motivated by that, not just in the service, but as the week in in preparation for what we're it's going to, to be doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Ask God, give me a sensitivity. What's going to happen this week? Mm -hmm. I just heard the pastor. He told me mm -hmm. what the message is going to be. Now, Lord, how can worship serve this environment? Uh, that may be more answer than you asked. Oh but no. But, it, honestly, that's exactly uh, the truth. And I love that the emphasis uh, shifts from how can I do as a performer? Or, you know, we, obviously, listen, I, I was there and I spent years on a platform helping to lead worship. And so I understand the and I appreciate the uh, uh, skill set that, that needs to be developed and how uh, difficult it is, especially for someone like myself, who's a little ADD, to be able to, uh, you know, take all of those experiences, uh, the things that you're feeling and you're having to manage, and then funnel them into this place where you set almost set all that aside, and it's about the presence of God. So I, I understand that delicate balance um, that these different artists and, and worship uh, leaders have. But um, I, I want to take this to another level of truth um, because of my own experience, Tony. And, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. I had conflicts that were deeply embedded within my own psyche, within my soul, because of some traumas that I experienced as a child, which is another conversation. Um, these things seem to almost split me as a person. And so I had um, a lot of difficulty, and yet I was so hungry for the presence of God. 
But I placed a lot of, for, for a major part of my life, and I very um, sincerely did this, I placed my identity and my self-worth in my performance, my ability to do the things that God had gifted me to do. And so I felt like, you know, I bring nothing to the table unless I'm the best at this. And so music was one of those things. And I felt like uh, there was a time in my life I thought, man, I, I can't imagine living without music. I'd rather be dead. And, you know, God's brought me a long way, Tony, because music has sat on the back burner for a while now. And that's that might be another conversation to have with you privately, because I think that maybe we need to stir that back up again. But I'm grateful for that season where God walked me through something where I had to set it down. And, and the reason I say this is because my worship went to another place. And in the sense that when I had to crash into my humanity, when I had to come to the end of my rope, so to speak, with Brenda, with my performances, with my abilities, with uh, my doings, and say, God, I'm a helpless, hopeless human being who needs you. And to realize that it was on that horizon that Jesus met me. He became the hope on my horizon. And he showed me who I was. There's a scripture that I absolutely love and I quote it all the time. And it's, it's from 2 Corinthians in the third chapter. And it talks about how that we stand before the mirror of his glory. And that's where we are. We come to him with our face unveiled. And so that speaks to me, to the uh, issues of projecting an image, you know, the, the masks that we wear, the performance we like to others to see and not really come. I don't want to invite them into my vulnerability or into the place that I don't even like myself, right? And so in this place, we have to come first to God in that place where, you know, the place that I don't even want to go visit myself, it's much too painful, but we allow God to his presence to come in. And in, it's in the glory of God that we're able to see the mirror of who we truly are. And we see ourselves as loved, as accepted, as enough for him to count us valuable enough to die for us, but that he is the one who completes us and he's my healer. And so in that, I find Brenda, I find out who I am. And so it was from there that God took me to a much deeper place. So I wonder, have you experienced this or perceived this in the issue of identity and how that that affects us even as worship leaders? Because it's impossible, I think. And I don't mean to just absorb all this time, but uh, just speak to that. I'm going to stop talking and, and I'm going to let you talk on this subject. Oh, Brenda, you know... <laughs> You know, you know, I can talk. <laughs> no, listen, we, we, I think we got the best Brenda at, when, when you were with us, um, uh, we got so the part, we got the version that had been, uh, you'd been taken through some difficult yeah. times and yeah. it is out of that brokenness that we benefited. Mm. And I, 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 don't, I wouldn't wish that wow. upon anyone. I, I would not wish that you would had gone had to have gone through those things but because yeah. your heart was pliable because you were open to God for him to do that work we benefited not just just the beauty the, your voice is so powerful and so beautiful but we got more we got we got depth you know uh, as a leader of worship ministry um uh it, you've got two responsibilities. You've got a responsibility certainly to the congregation because you're shepherding them. Right. Uh, you also, uh, you're, you're working with a team of, of creative people and, and you want to mm -hmm. pass to them. And so, mm -hmm. yes, the, the issue of performance, it, it fights against the, the, to yeah. worship, you know, and, and it, that's part of that deal where it just mm -hmm. takes time to help yeah. someone learn to recognize what is coming out mm -hmm. of our need to perform. And yeah. what of my identity is caught up in this. Now, listen, mm -hmm. worship music, by the way, there's an element of performance, even in worship. That's why it's so hard to separate. Yeah. Uh, 
because it by its nature that's the way god created music it's mm -hmm. very it's very uh uh entertaining to sit and listen and mm -hmm. that's why we as creatives of work i mean those of us who lead worship we are uh uh, we're, we're, we need to take that journey to be able to mm -hmm. help us to, to describe or to separate those two things. Because on a Sunday morning, when that congregation comes, uh, they don't need to be entertained. What they need yeah. is to have an encounter yeah. with a holy God that is going to impact their lives. I made this statement in the book. I said, you know, and, um, those coming on a Sunday morning, if they're confronted with a great song, they'll be entertained for the moment. But mm -hmm. if they have an encounter with a holy God, they'll be changed for yeah. a lifetime. So wow. our, our worship has to be uh, mindful of the need on Sunday morning. I There's mm -hmm. some Sunday mornings when I go into services, and it's so good, I just want to listen. And that's yeah. okay. Praise God. Yeah. These, these people are incredibly <laughs> talented, but it's just not the need yeah. on Sunday morning for these people to, to, to participate in the performance, so to say. Mm -hmm. They have a need mm -hmm. to be able to do that. That's so good. So, so good. And, and so what you're talking about in this book is really the shepherding aspect of helping to develop this uh, this understanding and this character and and just walking people through uh, their life experiences, standing there with them and kind of holding their hand, right to to help them to be able to navigate these things and and to understand it on on a deeper level. Because I think that the the element of worship it, it carries such a powerful impact and. Honestly, I think that the platform of the church is probably the one place that the enemy <laughs> desires to bring a little bit of chaos and self-focus and, yeah. and all those, those things that would keep us from experiencing the beauty of the cross. And, and like you said, the Gospels. We're living in such a, a, a time of, you know, it's like the, the worst of times and the best of times as we're seeing things happening, I mean, uh, our, our world is, we've just come through a two year pandemic and the, you know, economic crises and churches have had to reinvent and they're, they're kind of trying to figure out where do we go from here? And, you know, there's been a lot of wonderful things happen, but we've also seen institutions that have fallen and, and be exposed for wrongs that were never made right. And it just feels like a season where God is, is bringing correction and he's bringing us to a new place. And, you know, we've seen Russia invade Ukraine. And, and what's happening there is the Christians are on the rise and they're praying and they're, they're worshiping, Tony, they're worshiping in the midst of the threat of their lives and their, their freedom. They are worshiping God. Can you speak to the hurt that people are feeling right now, even in our Western world in the, in the next minute or so, can you just speak to the need for worship on a personal and private level? You know, in a, in a world like you have described, people, uh, as sometimes as a last resort, they are seeking the clarity and the refuge of the church. Worship is the first touch point when someone walks into a church, and mm -hmm. our worship it has to be clear. It has to be authentic. It has to be, yeah. we need to be able to let people experience the father. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, I just think we're living in a day right now where we can't afford uh, to uh, leave some of these sometimes young people to grasp and grope and, and for a meaningful ministry of worship. Uh, those of us who have been the, the, down that road, we need to be able to come alongside, shepherd, mentor, father mm -hmm. them on the things that are important, especially in the mm -hmm. day that we live. And uh, so, uh, so that was the reason for writing the book. I, I want yeah. it's, particularly it's not going to challenge someone intellectually all i'm doing is bringing a gospel filter yeah. over 
what it is that we've been doing for so many years. I love it. And show us your book again. And yeah. uh, the tell us, tell us the subtitle as well. We'll just read that whole thing. Yeah, it says, A Worship Shepherd, and it's a call to gospel-centered worship. And some of, the, gospel. uh, some of the chapters are vision and mission and values of a healthy worship ministry. A good worship leader is a shepherd first. The value mm -hmm. of singing the gospel. I mean, it's pretty basic wow. stuff. I love but, it, though. You know, the principles of the Lord are very simple, and we— uh, we tend to want to complicate things as human beings and uh, overcomplicate things. And that's when we get in trouble, right? <laughs> it's true. It's true. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I know that your book is going to be an, a, a, a wonderful encouragement to pastors and worship leaders everywhere. And so I just want to encourage our viewers today to find you and uh, to pick this resource up, how can they find you also online and maybe any encouragements that you might have there? You know, the best place is just TonyEllenberg.com. Uh, and I will share with you this. I, I hope the book does well. Uh, my mm -hmm. heart and my desire is to come alongside. Uh, I can't do everyone, but I'm going to probably find a few select worship leaders mm -hmm. who have a good a good heart and a willingness to learn. I want to come alongside and create a relationship with a, a few worship leaders and invest this, uh, wow. this book in them. So that's mm. part of the process. It's kind of a mentoring program. So they can reach mm. me at TonyEllenberg.com, uh, RioVitaMusic.com. That's a little more, more words. Yep. Uh, We'll but, put it up. That's okay. They'll be able to read it. That okay. is so wonderful. And I, I so appreciate you, my friend. And uh, the, the, the message of, that's in your heart and the gospel message that flows through you is so relevant to the needs of today. And so I just want to thank you for spending this time with me. I know that so many people could benefit from having a relationship with Tony Ellenberg, and I hope they do reach out to you. And I pray an abundance of blessing and favor over all that God has for you to do in this next season, because we're on a new frontier, right? Yes, that's so right. We really are. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate you. And to you, my friends, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. The, uh, the issue of worship is core to our being. It's what we were created for. And so I hope that you would maybe even play this message back again. And let it encourage you to go and find in your private sanctuary or in the communal worship of your church or with your friends or with your spouse or your family to worship Jesus because right now we need him more than ever. And so I thank you for joining me today and with my guest, Tony Ellenberg. And I'm going to invite you again next time to sit with us for another conversation. I'm Brenda Crouch.